many sections of the Doctrine and Covenants start out with a question. A question prompts a revelation from the Lord. And section 46 is, is no different. There's a question that leads to section 46. And the question is, who's allowed to come to church? Who can come and worship with us? And then the Lord answers this question from Joseph Smith by listing a bunch of spiritual gifts. And the answer is, Everyone has a spiritual gift, so everyone should be coming to church. But there are two spiritual gifts I want to talk about that he says in section 46, verses 12 and 13. So, the, or sorry, verses 13 and 14. So the Lord said that, so says this, To some it is given by the Holy Ghost to know that Jesus is the Son of God, and that he was crucified for the sins of the world. To others it is given to believe on their words, that they also might have eternal life if they continue faithful. So we have two gifts here. To some it is given to know and to some it is given to believe. Now, we often talk about how, how knowing is, is the pinnacle, where we, where we want to be. We want to know things. But sometimes God gives us the gift of belief instead of the gift of knowing. Now, I think it'd be interesting to ponder why would some people know and why would some people believe? And how can having the gift to believe bless us as a people? Because there's a reason that God gives some people the gift to believe on the words of others and to others the gift to know. So my parents are both converts to the church. They've been active and faithful ever since. And my dad loves the Book of Mormon. He's read it maybe 200 times uh, since he joined the church 50 years ago. And there's this, there's, there's this park by my house that we would drive through a lot as we would, and, and still do, my parents still live in the same house. And as a, as a kid, we would drive through this park all the time. And every time we drove through this park, my dad would share his testimony with me. He would tell me that he knew the Book of Mormon was true, that Joseph Smith was a prophet, that Jesus was the Christ, that God lived every single time we drove through this park. And so for, for my whole growing up, I knew that my dad knew. And I don't think I had my own testimony at the time. I, 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 I believe things. I enjoyed church. I, I went every week. You know, I, I, I liked the scriptures just fine. But I got to believe on his words because I didn't know for myself. And then when I was 14 years old, I attended my first youth conference. Now, I was not very popular when I was 14, and I didn't super want to go to this youth conference. I really only went because my sister signed, signed me up. And I went and honestly had a bit of a tough time at first. It was hard to connect, hard to, hard to make friends. But by the end of the, the, the three-day youth conference, I was having a blast. And the last day of the youth conference, we had a testimony meeting. And youth after youth, you know, peer after peer of mine got up to share their testimony. And I did not share my testimony, but as I listened to them share their te testimonies, something happened that I'd never experienced before. It felt, it's hard to describe really spiritual experience, but it felt like a warm blanket was wrapped around me. Like I just like felt this warmth and I felt like God's love and presence and everything just felt so real for the very first time. And I remember I was sitting in this cabin that, that was that was a bit of a walk from from this room where we we had the this testimony meeting. And I walked out of the testimony meeting. I just didn't want to talk to anyone for like fear of like, bursting this, this beautiful bubble I'd been in. I remember walking across this grass and thinking, how can I ever go back to watching TV and playing video games after this? Like I felt like I'd had a real glimpse of what mattered and what was important. And I thought, how can I go back to these things I've experienced before? I feel like that was the first time I, I didn't just believe, but I knew that God was real, that he loved me and, and that he was there. And in, in the book of Galatians, Paul talks about the gifts of the spirit and how we feel the spirit. And the spirit feels like love and peace, and joy, and temperance, and patience. You know, the Spirit feels like all these things. And that was a little bit of what I experienced that day. I'm sure you're familiar with, with Alma 32 in the Book of Mormon, but there are, are some scriptures in, in, in Alma 32 where, where it talks about how, how the Word of God is compared to a seed, and if we plant the seed, it will grow. And then throughout the chapter, Alma explains what happens as we plant the seed. So in Alma 32, verse 33, he says this, And now behold, because you have tried the experiment that is planting the seed and planted the seed and it swelleth and sprouteth and beginneth to grow, you must needs know that the seed is good. And so as, as, as the seed grows, we know it's good. And then he goes on to say this, and this is, he talks about the things that we actually know. He says, and now behold, is your knowledge perfect? Yea, your knowledge is perfect in that thing and your faith is dormant. And this because you know, now he's going to list four things that we know. For you know that the word has swelled your souls and ye also know that it has sprouted up, and, you, and your understanding doth begin to be enlightened, and your mind doth begin to expand. Okay, these four things that we know. We know that, this, that, the, that it swelled our souls, the seed is sprouted, our understanding is enlightened, and our mind doth begin to expand. You know, there's no better way for me to describe that experience I'd had as a youth in, in, in a youth conference than that my mind was expanded. And I felt something I, I'd, I'd never felt before. And so often we, we know the things that we have experienced. And he goes on to say in verse 35, 
O then is not this real. I say unto you, yea, because it is light and whatsoever is light is good because it is, is discernible. And so the, these things, these things we experience, we get to know and we know what we've experienced. So what do we do if sometimes our experience with the gospel isn't always good? What if the, we, we plant the seed and the fruit doesn't always feel great? I've had some tough times as a member of the church. When I was about 30 years old, and I'm 39 now, I know I look so much younger. When I, when I was 30, I was just wondering if the church was the right place for me. You know, as a gay member, I just felt that there was no place in this doctrine and this culture for a person like me. And I was really struggling. And throughout this whole time, I was trying my very best. I was going to church every week. I was reading the scriptures every day. I was praying every day. I was really trying my best to be a good Latter-day Saint and a good disciple of Jesus Christ and honor my identity as a child of God. And yet I was miserable. I was absolutely miserable. And it felt like the fruits of living the gospel were just rotten and just weren't working. And so I, I got in my car in Arizona where I was living at the time, and I drove all the way to my parents' house in Washington State in Seattle, which is a two-day drive. And I had a lot of time to think and ponder. And then when I got home, I told my parents everything that had been going on, how I wasn't sure there was a place for me. And my mom told me that she was going to honor my agency, that whatever I chose, there was nothing I could do that could take me outside of the circle of our family's love. And she told me, if you need to, to leave the church and marry a man, you and he will always be part of our family. And that was such a kind thing for her to do, to say, we trust you, whatever you choose, we're going to honor your agency. And so I decided, you know what, this church isn't the right place for me. I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. And so I decided that I was going to stop attending church. But I had a strong testimony of Jesus and a strong testimony of, of, of heavenly parents. And I decided I wasn't going to give up on them. So I kept reading every day and praying every day and, and studying the word of God. And by the time Sunday, the next Sunday rolled around, I'd changed my mind. So I was actually super bad at leaving the church. But this is what happened. I found myself reading in Matthew 26 that week in my parents' house. And in Matthew 26, the Savior's in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says this prayer that, that, I, that I'm sure you're familiar with. Let's see, Matthew 26. So this is the Savior in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says this in verse 39. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And as I kept reading, I noticed something I'd never noticed before. Three verses later in verse 42, it says, And he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And then two verses later in verse 44, And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Now, it never occurred to me how much the Savior didn't want to do this, that three times he asked for a way out of what he was being asked to do. And for the first time in my life, it occurred to me, my mind expanded, and, I, and it occurred to me that, that Jesus didn't want to do this thing. And it's Christ-like to not want to do something hard, but it's also Christ-like to do the Father's will, whatever it is. And so after reading these verses, I had th this strong impression that I just needed to do God's will, whatever it was. And to just be willing to, to accept to accept whatever he was asking me to do. And so I knelt down and said a very fervent prayer. And I said, Heavenly Father, whatever you're asking me to do, I will do it. And I meant it. And as I prayed, I felt a very, very clear and very annoying prompting that I was being called to move forward within the teachings of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And that wasn't what I wanted because I'd been doing that already. And I was miserable. And I thought, well, I don't want to be miserable anymore. And so after spending a week or so at my parents' house, I got in my car and drove back to Arizona. I thought, okay, well, something needs to change. I, I can't just keep doing the things I'm, I've been doing. Something has to be different. And as I thought, as, as, I, as I spent, you know, two days driving back to Arizona, I thought about all the things I was doing. And I thought, well, you know what? I can't read my scriptures every day anymore. Instead, I'm going to study the word of God every day. I'm not, I'm not going to pray anymore. I'm going to commune with God and seek inspiration from him. I thought, well, I'm not going to go to church anymore. I'm going to worship with the saints every week and renew my covenants with God. And so all these things I was already doing, I decided to keep doing them, but to deepen them in new and different ways. And I went from this place where I felt like I, I was trapped in a doctrine and a culture that I felt had no place for me to a place where I felt free and happy and light. And it was because I wasn't just doing a checklist of things that I'd been taught to do, but because I was living my life in a way that God was calling me to do. And, and that was really a life-changing experience because my parents honored my agency and let me seek inspiration on my own. Now, receiving inspiration can, can be a hard thing. I love the word impression when we talk about the feelings of the Holy Ghost, because the way I so often feel is it feels like, like, like a, a thought is like pressed on me. Like it, it's something that comes from, from outside of me. 
And so I love that, that, that meaning of impression. And so it's, it's often hard to distinguish our own thoughts from the feelings of the spirit. But to me, when the spirit talks to me, it's just like this feeling gets pressed on me and it won't go away. And I'll give you one, one example of that. So for years, I'd, been want, I'd wanted to write a book about my experience as, as a gay member of the church and what I'd learned about the atonement through that experience. But it just felt like such a big, daunting task. And I was like, I can't do that. That's too much work. But I, I wanted to do it. And in, in 2019, a good friend of mine, her, her name is Beth, she, she said, Ben, no, I'm sorry, it was actually 2018. Not that the years super matter. And she said, Ben, you need to write a book. I will help you every step of the way. I want you to do this thing. I was like, that's great. Let's do it. And then a year passed and I did nothing. And so in the summer of 2019, Beth reached out to me again. And she said, Ben, you got to do this thing. And I said, all right, I'll do it. And so I wrote a proposal and I sent a book proposal to Deseret Book and emailed it to them. And they wrote me back not too long after that. And this was the summer of 2019. They said, we're very busy. We might look at this in the fall. And I was like, well, that was a polite no. So I thought that was the end of it. And then as I go through and reread my journal from that time, over and over again, I'm writing in my journal. I feel like I should be working on this book. I just want to work on this book. I should be spending more time working on this book, but I just never did. But clearly the impression was there again and again and again. And in November of 2019, I, I heard back from Desert Book. And they said, we love your, we love your manuscript. And we love to, we, or we, we loved your proposal. We'd love to see your manuscript. And I thought, oh shoot, I didn't write anything. And I didn't have anything to give them. And I had been getting this prompting for, for months and had been ignoring it. And so I said, can you, give me, can you give me a month and a half? And they said, yes, once you have a manuscript, please, please send it to us. And so I wrote my whole book in about seven weeks. But the first week of that was awful. Like it just was not flowing. And I thought, what have I done? I, I, I felt like I'd messed up this divine timeline. God had been prompting me to do something and I, and I wasn't doing it right. And so after a week of working on the book and just wasn't coming, coming, coming together, I asked a good friend of mine for a blessing. I told him the fear I'd had that God had been telling me to do this thing. And now I hadn't done it. Now everything was delayed and it wasn't going to work out right. And I just messed this all up. And in the blessing, he told me not to worry about other people, that God would take care of them, but that people, many people would be blessed by my book and they'd be blessed by the opportunity they had to walk in my shoes. And that's how my book got its name, A Walk in My Shoes, from, from that blessing. And so after that blessing, I thought, okay, this is God's work, not mine. He'll, he'll take care of it. I said to do the, my very best. And so I got the, the rest of the manuscript written in six weeks, like in record time. It was all I did. And then Desert Book liked it and they decided to publish it. And I found out officially they were going to publish it in, in April of, of 2020. And they said, but it wasn't going to come out until May of the next year. I said, no, that is too long. God wants this out sooner. Is there any way that we can get this out sooner? And, and uh, they said, nope, we have a very strict publishing schedule. That's when it's coming out. And I, and I just pray. I said, Heavenly Father, you told me to do this and I messed it up. Will you please fix this timeline? And then a few weeks later, they got back to me and said, we have an opening in our publishing schedule. It's actually going to come out now in, in January of 2020, of January, 2020, 2021. And I just felt like it all worked out the way it was, it was the way it was supposed to do. So again and again, I've been getting this prompting that I've been ignoring, but, it, but it was, it was pressed on me over and over and over again. And so what I would invite you to do is, is, is pay attention to your feelings, take time to, to think and ponder and slow down and think about the, the, the feelings you're getting again and again and again. It might be to, to reach out to a friend or it might be to try something different in your life. It might be to start journaling or maybe a way to, to improve your prayers. I don't know. But as we, as we listen to the, those impressions that get pressed upon us, that's how we can really make a difference and know if we know. I just want to end by, by, by sharing one quick scripture. And this comes from the, the Doctrine and Covenants. And in section, in section 124 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the saints are, are in Nauvoo and they're commanded to build the Nauvoo Temple. And so they've just moved to this new place. They're going to start the Nauvoo Temple. And, and this is what the Lord tells them. It, it, it's Doctrine and Covenants section 124, verses 43 and 42. So the Lord says this, And ye shall build it, the temple, and ye shall build it on the place where ye have contemplated building it. For that is the spot which I have chosen for you to build it. Isn't that so convenient? Like where you want to build it, that's where we want you to build it. But then he says this. He says, If ye labor with all your might, I will consecrate that spot that it shall be made holy. Isn't that beautiful? If ye labor with all your might, I will consecrate that spot that it shall be made holy. Now, all of us have, have things in our lives that we can labor on. And God can make things holy for us. He can make our scripture study holy. He can make our family prayers holy. He can make our studies holy. He can even make our, our friendships and our relationships holy if we labor with all of our might. Now, I don't know why, why to some people it's given the gift to know and why others they're given the gift to believe. But I know that that is how God works. 
he doesn't give all of us the same knowledge. He doesn't give all of us the same information. And that is for a purpose. And so I, I invite you to, 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 to look at the gifts of God that he has given you, because I know that all of us have been given gifts of God so that we can benefit one another. And I share that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 